Hi, everybody. Uh, it's Allison. I'm just doing a quick update. Um, actually, Jason and I are going to have a, um, a stream tonight, another installment in our Arkansas Odyssey. Um, so it's only a couple hours. It's nothing too intense. So that's going to be on at 8 o'clock tonight, Eastern time. So hopefully you can join in then. Uh, but I just I wanted to give a little bit of an update. I was away this week. Um, I spent the week in Pittsburgh and I was uh, doing research at the archives of the University of Pittsburgh and looking at the Oliver Riser papers. And, um, you know, if you've been following me, you know, it's this time of transition and we're still finishing getting the house ready to put on the market. There is like a house that's it's bigger than ours and fancy and ours across the street, but it just sold for a crazy amount of money. So like, I'm hoping that's a good sign, even though the mortgage rates are still high, that there's not a lot of inventory in Philadelphia. So, if you know, anybody who wants a beautiful 1880s house, um, row house, you know, have them look on Zillow in about a month. Um, but yeah, so, and, you know, just to be clear, just, you know, not to be pity party me, but, you know, just this, this sort of speaks to some of the stuff that I've been like where I'm at in terms of choices that I've made is that ultimately my young adult child are, are, it came back on spring break to say goodbye to the house, their childhood home. We've been in this house for 25 years and um, didn't want me here. Didn't want to see me still, um, which is really hard. And so I'm trying to sort of walk through this with grace and understand that they have their process and it is what it is. But um, for, you know, for anyone who's inclined to sort of think because I sort of speak about these things in a oddly detached way or spunky way or whatever, that somehow um, the stuff I'm navigating isn't challenging. It's very challenging. And really the only way that I, the only control that I have over it is how I'm reacting. And so my reaction was, I'm not going to skulk off my house, um, our house, um, but I'm going to make a plan so that I can actually do productive work. And so uh, my plan was to um, go to Pittsburgh for the week. I got a little room in an Airbnb near in Oakland, the Oakland neighborhood um, near the Carnegie Mellon campus. And I spent all week going through all of our risers papers. And so for people well, that not actually not all, probably about a little more than half. Um, and if you aren't familiar with Oliver Riser, why he's important, um, you know, early on in this process, I stumbled across the Foundation for Integrated Education. And it was connected to Fritz Kunst, who was the head of North American Theosophy, and Henry Marginow, who was a physicist at Yale, and Julia Stolman, who uh, was a lumber baron um, in Brooklyn who was very connected to the founding of the state of Israel and uh, Shabbat and a number of other high level academics, Pitcherim Sorapkin, who was at Harvard, a sociologist, and, um, and Riser was in this mix. And so I really feel like this foundation for integrated education goes back to this enlightenment idea of bringing the scientific the natural philosophy and the social sciences together and integrating them and making them computational. And that's sort of what Leibniz was after. Um, and so Riser was at Pitt from the late, well, actually like the early 1940s, so World War II era, all the way through the early 1970s. He spent most of his whole academic career there. I think he, he got his PhD from Ohio State. And he had an incredible correspondence. And it's, so it's kind of interesting. Um, there's a finding aid um, online, uh, but there were 14 boxes. Um, and like I, I had done some archival work in graduate school. So if you're familiar with those archival boxes is that um, like they're about the size of a sheet of paper and then they're about like six to eight inches deep and they're gray. And so they're like kind of file folder boxes. And so when I saw that the collection was 14 boxes, I thought, well, hey, I, I can come for a five day week and get through all of them. Right. And so I show up on the first day and they're not actually archival, the, the little gray boxes, they're file boxes. <laughs> so I was like, oh, my gosh, I'm not going to be able to get through all of these boxes. Um, but I, I got through all of his correspondence. And it's so amazing to sort of think about um, 
just letters, like letters that people wrote, as, especially this is in an academic context, um, but the reciprocity and the exchange of articles because it was pre-internet and the print and so newspaper articles and reprints and preprints of papers given and the sort of the extensive, like people must have probably spent like three hours a day writing letters. Um, and so it was an interesting view because there were at least four solid file boxes of correspondence. And a lot of them were on like um, airplane, air, air mail stuff. So it was very thin. So there were a lot. Um, and you're not reading the person's letters, you're reading their responses to the letters. So it's sort of this inversion. Um, and there was a lot of, you know, you, you could understand the milieu of, of where he was working, like what his intellectual community was, what his social community was, because some of them were also um, personal correspondences of people who were interested in his ideas. And like, I have to say, I was going in thinking that like, and I'm still very concerned about the Foundation for Integrated Education. And ultimately, I, there were not, there were some papers about that, but there was like no smoking gun or really compelling information. It was other unexpected things that I found. Um, but I, I kind of, I'm interested, I'm like, I feel a connection to Oliver Reiser in some way because he was an interdisciplinary thinker and he was trying to figure out how the world worked. And um, so his books, he wrote The World Sensorium, which is still readily available on Amazon as a reprint. That was 1946. And that's pretty much laying out essentially that we're neuroblasts in a global brain and the noosphere and this idea. But he, I don't think he was writing it from like an evil genius, like, oh, I can't wait till I get all the ants in my ant computer and then I can run them around and things like they were recovering from the traumatic traumas that they lived through, both the World War II trauma and then the Cold War trauma after that and then the Vietnam War. So there were, you know, all of these traumas that against this backdrop was this idea that we have to get our shit together and, um, you know, we need world peace, right? And so their idea was, how do we do that? Well, we need to uplift humanity's consciousness and we need like a one world government and we need a one world religion and we need to do it from outer space with satellites. And that seemed a lot, like not because they were trying to be bad people. It's just that they saw the conditions and they were trying to figure out, well, how does it work? And Reiser actually had a lot of correspondences with physics, physicists and um many, many stacks and stacks of papers um, and, and magazine articles about various topics in quantum physics that was all emerging in the later part of his career. Um, so he was trying to figure it out. Um, and then after World Sensorium, he wrote a number of other books, but one of them was about color theory. And so I've been corresponding with Steffers and Sean a lot more about lipids and retinas and color um, and color therapy and, and biophotons and light. So that's really interesting. And then he wrote another book called The Holiest Earth about the Glastonbury Zodiac, about the Glastonbury tour, and then these earth fields. And he was he was very interested in like parapsychology and psychic work. And so he had this very diverse set of interests. And you could see this in his correspondence. And you could see sort of the collegiality. So the um I guess what I was saying is like, I feel like I've come to understand um, more, like I can have empathy for where his viewpoint, like where he stood and what he was doing and, and realizing that trying to make him out as the bad guy or the people, anyone involved in this group as the bad people is not super effective. Um, and so anyway, so I'm, I'm, I, I spent, and this is kind of the funny thing. I'm just going to be a little chatty here, but um, like, I'm a hard worker. <laughs> <laughs> and I work at things that don't get paid. And so it's kind of funny because, you know, I'm navigating all this stuff with my divorce about, you know, money, which on paper is more like my husband's bringing more in more income than me. At this point, I don't have any because I've left my job a few years ago under the lockdowns. But um, like I work really hard. So like I was up at nine. A, like I was there the entire hours of the, at the archives from night because I saw those file boxes. And I'm like, I don't want to leave any stone unturned as much as I can. I'm going to go through as much as I can. And I really only could get through one file box a day. And what I did was I would read and I would scan. And then I took a lot of pictures on my phone. Um, and then I actually have them on a shared drive that I can link to here. Um, if you guys want to look at them, they're not well ordered. They're in order of the files that I 
looked at, but th many of them are, are important, like academic papers that are probably you can't get other places. So I need to like put those in subfolders and retitle everything. But, um, you know, I made it for all of us to share if you're interested, you know, and, and that's how I do things. Um, because at this point, I still can and I can do that and not charge, you know, to give special privileges to special people who pay me and all this stuff. Like I'm just putting it out there because we should all look at this together. Um, so the the first, I guess it was maybe the second day, um, I was I was asking about another set of books, uh, b boxes that I wanted to get. And uh, the archivist is kind of an interesting community because like I'm I'm totally a nerd too. So I would imagine like, and I was just saying like, I worked really hard. Like I was there, I didn't even take a lunch break. I was there from like nine until 4.30 going through the boxes and taking, I took 1800 pictures <laughs> in, two, in five days, right? So I have to like, now I have to go back and organize them. But um, so the second day, you know, and there's this whole culture of the arc, like there's no windows and it's just like a little, like you have to put all your stuff in a locker and, you know, and I, you know, I didn't even actually take written notes because I was just going through taking photos, photos, photos. Um, but so I was asking this archivist and um, he, like he was very much the spiffy archivist and he had on like the sport coat and he had a bow tie and, you know, a beard, trimmed beard and, um, you know, and I was trying to talk to him. I was excited. It was early in the day. So there weren't other researchers that I was interrupting about my conversation, but I was trying to get him excited about Oliver Reiser. Cause again, this is the Pitt archives. He was a Pitt professor. I'm like, you should know about, cause he's like, oh, I'm the philosophy of science archivist. And you know, I could, you should look at this box. This is, you know, he was just wacky. You know, those people did astrology and he, like he was so dismissive. <laughs> and like this last box that he had processed was essentially a correspondence with a wealthy woman in Palo Alto. And it was very much a personal correspondence. And even though I went through that whole box at the end, um, it wasn't professional, right? And, and again, I'm not, I'm not a professional, so I'm not like putting professionals above personal, but essentially he was just dismissing all of it without even knowing who Riser was. And I'm like, well, do you, do you know about J.B. Ryan and the parapsychology lab at Duke? And do you know about Marginau and the physics and his focus on the nature of reality? And like, do you, do you, like these are serious academics that are involved in this work. And uh, and he didn't really want to know. And then I was trying to explain Web3, right? And, and then he knew a little bit about AI, right? But he was always like, well, there's not enough data storage. There's not, like he kept dismissing everything. I'm like, they're not not building that. They're building this. Like it's coming. Do you not think that they have figured out how they're going to store the data? Because again, as a philosophy of science guy, you should realize that the public facing science is probably 20 to 30 years behind what they actually have in their back pocket. <laughs> I mean, if you studied it long enough, you realize that the black box science is well ahead of what we're allowed to know about, right? And so they're not building the smart cities and the edge computing and the biotechnology, not having any idea where they're gonna put the data, right? It's, it's in, in my opinion, it's going to be biohybrid. Like, we're they're going to be using our biology to interface with the information fields and it's going to be through you know photonics and optics and entrainment and we're part of the computer like that's the nosphere that's that's what riser was talking about tell hard day jardin and bernadsky and he just had no clue because it wasn't the story he wanted to live in his story was i'm an archivist and we have a problem storing all of our records and we can't digitize them because we don't have the data storage. And I'm like, well, one, they don't actually want to make all of this stuff available because if they did, it would start to complicate things, right? You know, and even you're supposed to like sign a thing like, I'm not going to put it on the internet. Like, why are they limiting the information, right? It's there to be perused. It's publicly available information. There's nothing confidential in it. So yes, put it out there, right? But he was so resistant. And then eventually he's like, oh, but I was a cognitive, I was in a neuroscience, I worked in a neuroscience lab before I was the philosophy of, you know, uh, archivist of the philosophy of science. I'm like, oh, really? And I'm like, yeah, well, you know, I just went because, um, it was making uh, uh, hearts, you know, I do the hearts and, you know, I've, I've really winnowed down on the stuff that I have in my house because, you know, I'm trying to pack everything and curate it, get rid of stuff, um, put it out, you know, not, I'm not getting rid of my little special things that I make my hearts out of, but I'm trying to like have less, right? Like put them out, make the hearts and do the thing. And so my friend Eve, uh, who was in Satellite Beach, Florida, um, she's regularly sent me shells. So a lot of the beautiful shells you see are from Eve. And so she had sent me this little box of shells. And it's kind of amazing because it was like, 
I don't know, like eight inches by 10 inches by four inches, like that sort of size, like smaller than a shoebox, full of shells. <laughs> like you would not imagine how many shells were in that shoebox. And so um, I was I was texting um, a couple people like with images and one of them was stuffers. And she's like, oh, do you have time to make a stop while you're um, in Pittsburgh? Because she has this amazing article from, again, so early. And like, I would encourage people to go back and I, I actually, I haven't done this yet. I need to make a blog post, which is like linking to all of her old articles uh, because she was so ahead of the curve on so much of this stuff. But she was talking about these like nanobodies and the Department of Energy research around like, you know, the pandemic research and that they were drawn from llamas. And it was like such a, it was like free Wally and it was about the llama nanobodies in the Department of Energy. And so it turns out that this lab that was processing the llama nanobodies was in Pittsburgh. And so I ended up going and taking some of Eve's shells and making a, um, a heart, you know, in uh, the building, because again, these medical complexes, they're so impersonal, right? And I'm, it's raining and I'm driving around, I'm trying to find a parking space because like you can't find free street parking anywhere near hospitals. But I found a loading zone and it's like raining and I grabbed my box of shells that Eve sent and um, I'm looking for a spot and I'm picking up a... Um, there's like all these masks thrown into the mulch and the landscaping. And so I'm like, I pick up a mask and I'm like, I'm going to incorporate you. And I, I, I go to the building and, and, you know, these buildings, they have all of, there's lots of stuff because they're big buildings. And the sign was for the eye and ear sit, uh, thing, which is really interesting because the work that we're doing now is a lot about, um, uh, lipids and retinal lipids and understanding reality and schizophrenia and things like that. And so this idea of controlling your senses, the fact that this llama nanobody thing is like in the same building where the feature sign is the eye and ear Institute, which is again, a largely how we understand our reality is seeing and hearing it. I thought this is perfect. So I put the mask down and then I put, I'm trying to think of what I had a quartz crystal and I had the shells and I had some feathers and anyway, and then I ran and got back in my car. So, um, but, you know, I'm talking to this guy, he's like, oh yeah, I was doing neuroscience research. And, and I'm like, well, do you know about optogenetics, right? And the rhodopsins. And, um, oh, you know what? I'm realizing that this light is not great. Let me see if I can adjust this just a sec. Okay. Ha <laughs> ha, live. <laughs> um, so the rhodopsins are these light activated proteins that are introduced into the body of people and dragonflies and all sorts of things through like viral vectors, adenoviruses or something like that. And so they get these proteins in and then they're light activated and then they use the light. Now they used to have to like drill little, um, like put pins and things to try to get the light into the brain. But now it's all nanotechnology and genetic engineering. It's this protein engineering, right? Well, so this stuff is being developed actually at Pitt, like retinal therapeutics with viruses that contain the optogenetics. Um, at Pitt, like there's a paper in 2021 that's talking about like a successful therapeutic with optogenetics. Well, this guy was in optogenetics back when they were still sticking the thing, pins, you know, when trying to get the light in with certain sensors. Like, but I'm like, dude, it's nanotechnology. This is like they're using our biology for is part of the technology. Like our, our biology is the best technology. It's doing things like the whole fat fingers, sticky fingers. We can't figure out how to do CAD with our 3D printing nano stuff. So we'll just do it in your in our body or in the body of yeast or in something else's body because the body has the precision and the, the beauty and the sophistication to make these self-assembling particles into the things we want. We'll just use biology as a, as a bioreactor, as a factory. And so again, he's like the bow tie man. And I'm like, hey, you know, I mean, this is the the arc of it of the, the lab at, at Pitt is called the Cheng, uh, the Cheng Zhang lab. C H E N G Z H A N G, the Cheng Zhang lab, um, with the llama body bodies. And and definitely look up Steffer's work at a piece of mindful about free Wally and the llama nanobodies. Um but yeah, so th this archivist, like he doesn't know what he doesn't know, but he's got the bow tie and he's got, I'm sure probably a PhD and he knows the stuff, right? And so he's essentially like, kind of like patting me on the head, little lady, like here, you want to be looking at this box about the silly stuff about like astrology and the whatever, whatever. So he doesn't actually have to understand what he's in. 
right? Like he actually doesn't have to understand what Pittsburgh is. He doesn't have to understand Web3. He can just pretend that none of this is happening because there's not enough data storage. He doesn't have to contemplate what's actually happening is that like the future of data storage is DNA data storage, which at this point, that's the University of Washington is artificial. But I think ultimately, like it's not going to be outside of our body. It's going to be we're going to be integrated into the Borg if we don't actually talk about it. So anyway, it was just a bit. So the overall framing is like he was trying to talk about it. And I said, um, he's like, why are you here? Right. And that's so that's that's my framing question of the morning. Why are you here? <laughs> because most people are in the archives because they're writing a book, right? Or they're writing a paper or they're making an exhibit or I don't know, maybe they're researching a script for a play or th there's a specific reason often related to a professional endeavor or possibly like a civic endeavor, maybe that they're pursuing. And so people like me who show up and I'm like, I'm just trying to figure out what's going on. <laughs> Because I knew that Oliver Riser and the circle around Oliver Riser was a key to that. And before I left the Northeast, and who knows when I would be back, I figured I'm going to use this opportunity. If my kid doesn't want to see me and they want to say goodbye to the house and have me not be here, I'm going to use this time productively. And I'm going to spend, you know, seven and a half hours a day in the archive figuring out what was happening around Oliver Riser to understand the story. But it's open source intelligence, right? It's you have to essentially lift up every file, open it, scan it, contextualize it. Is this, oh, is this just a letter that's talking about a preprint, right? Um, and that it's not really nothing substantive about just like a publication thing, put that back in. You know, is this just a fan letter, put that back in. Oh, it's okay, here's Edgar Mitchell, right? Oh, here's Barbara Marks Hubbard. Oh, here. And who's on the sidebar of the organ, like the boards of these organizations? Who's on the letterhead? What are the dates? What are the conferences they went to? What are the newsletters, right? This is all in the, but you have to actually scan, you know, and again, I didn't get it all, but I think the boxes I didn't look at were mostly his manuscripts, but I got through all the correspondence because you, you actually have to see the landscape as a whole before you can find the pattern. At least that's how I work. Right. I work, scan the landscape and see what story is it telling you. Right. And the story that I took away was that Oliver Reiser was probably an introverted, super smart, neurodiverse guy who likes to correspond with smart women. <laughs> he had a number of correspondences with smart women and like collaborate through letters on big ideas. Right. That involved what he thought was evolving the world to a higher plane, which is the super like human potential movement, no sphere thing. And he thought the way to do it was through satellite education, which totally puts the whole like corporation for public broadcasting and all that stuff in a new light. Like, and, and that was walking hand in hand with the space race and NASA, but it was about psychology and it was about parapsychology and it was about the, this evolutionary process. And, and that was my takeaway, but I had to read all of the letters to see it, not just one box that he called silly. And so I, I guess like the, why are you here is for me, it's this idea of, it's a, you know, I, I talk a lot about gamification, right? That they're gamifying it. And so I don't want to call it a quest because that's fully part of this whole gamification scenario, but like I feel called to take this journey to um, go to places and and sift through and try to come up to some assessment of my personal understanding of what has happened in the world around me that foundationally ripped apart the fabric of how I understood the world. And is and then I'm hopefully once I get that sorted out, <laughs> mostly, you know, not that I'm ever going to sort out all of it, but then I can start to weave together something new and meaningful, like with the next, you know, knock on wood, you know, 20 or so years of my life in this new understanding and doing it, doing it for me and putting this stuff out there for other people who may be um, similar pilgrims. And, um, you know, as I was putting some outlines together today, I was remembering that, so there were maybe 
four or five kind of shells and I'm not a shell person, so I don't know, but there was some, a lot of beautiful, like the spiral snail shells. And then these like, is it like olive something shells, like the sort of long elongated spiral shells and the co little conch shells. And then um, these very silvery iridescent, almost, they almost like look like fingernails. They're bigger than fingernails, like the size of a quarter and like they're sort of cream color and you could almost see through them. Um, and then there were these, uh, Magenta, I guess is kind of like uh, purpley magenta and white speckled little scallop shells that were maybe about this big. And so those were sort of the main types of shells that were in the box. And I was thinking back to the scallop shell because, um, you know, a while ago, I watched this movie with Martin Sheen called The Way. And uh, I think it was done, produced by his son, Emilio Estevez, is that his name? And they're, you know, they're very Catholic. And um, in the, the the script of the play, he has uh, like a fraught relationship with his son, who's going to, who's going out to seek the world. And this, you know, the son is maybe in his late twenties or early thirties. And the son goes to make the pilgrimage in, um, in Spain, I guess, Spain and Portugal, <clears throat> along the El Camino, the road, the way. And it's the pilgrimage of St. James uh, Santiago to the, the Church of Santiago de Compostela. And so and along the way, the son wanders off into like a snowstorm and he dies unexpectedly. And so the father goes to get his remains and his effects. But the, then the father, who's like a retired dentist, golf playing guy in California, decides to complete the journey for his son. And so it's quite a touching, like, and again, it's this landscape and it's a communal landscape of pilgrimage. And, and part of that, the story, they keep saying like different people make this pilgrimage for different reasons. And sometimes you don't even fully appreciate why you're walk making this pilgrimage. You find it out on the road, right? And so it really just struck me this morning because part of the reason that I'm doing this is that like I got really triggered by some stuff yesterday and I was so anxious and I was like, I called up my called up Jason. I'm like, can you believe this? I'm so upset. And he's like, just calm down. Like, don't do anything. Just be, you know, like, and I'm like, I'm not doing anything right now because I'm, it's already late and I'm in my nightgown, <laughs> but this is what has me really upset. And so part of this is like also figuring out how to navigate our own interior space because once you see this landscape and how expansive it is, I think you you realize that if if what you're looking at is to examine a they thing that is out there, that is a threat that is out there, and and just to add to the list of the they's that are scary and doing bad things, um, which I did, I did that for quite a number of years. Um, <laughs> was not super successful. Um, but I, you know, I went through that and I don't think that's where it is. I think actually what we're about here, and this is maybe the takeaway from Riser, because I actually do believe that there is something happening in terms of not just like the ascension and the split and people are going off onto roads and like, that's not how I understand it. But I, I do feel like and I don't think it's a cycle that we haven't had this before. Like, I think there's many cultures that have had a much more direct connection to the divine and to the beyond of whatever this material reality is um, through sacred practices um, of various sorts, um, Christian, non-Christian, like many, many ways in. But this developing our own internal discipline and our own... Um, way of seeing the world and our own way of regulating our emotions, which I was not doing well last night, is part of this. And that's part of what the way is, is that the way is also mastering yourself, right? Mastering yourself within a landscape of challenges that is presented. And so anyway, so that's what I wanted. So that's why I was there, right? Like I'm trying to both understand the landscape and then master myself 
within it so that I can navigate it the best. So it's an interesting movie, Martin Sheen. I, you know, like, it's so funny now that you look like I'm so out of the political ideology thing and, you know, imagining, oh, like, did we all want Martin Sheen to be president? <laughs> you know, like what that all was, right? What all of that, the West Wing television show was to talk about social policy and everything. And I'm in such a different place now, but um, Eve shells <clears throat> and the scallops, because that goes back. So on, on the way, the, the symbol of the St. James is the scallop. And I think originally the pilgrims, um, people making the pilgrimage would use these scallop shells to scoop water to drink like a small cup or to hold food or something like that. But it became like a, it's interesting, it was a badge, it was a token, right? And so it's these early tokens, these early symbols. And, and Riser was very interested in semantics and semiotics and static steganography. He felt that if he, in order to create this peaceful world that you needed a unity, like a synthesis, and that a common language was part of it. And, and that there were there was someone that he was working with, I think his last name was Bliss, Charles C.K. Bliss or something, who was very much, he was an engineer. He's like, electrical engineering diagrams, everybody can understand. We need that for language. Um, but that the, 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 the scallop shell was that symbol. And so like, again, coming out of this trip in Pittsburgh, like it's even just reflecting on it, yeah, it was a pilgrimage. It was part of the way for me, right? And we each have our own ways to make. So um, so anyway, uh, yeah, not a bad guy. These are sort of my main takeaways from Riser. And maybe I'll try to like write up a quick blog post and put the link in. But um, it was about entraining the psyche, right? It's, I've, I've, you know, I've, I've been making this journey, right? And the journey was education and social policy and then web three and token engineering. And then ultimately it's, I think it's consciousness engineering, but consciousness engineering through biology, <clears throat> through the, um, literally like through the chakras. And I'm not a great practitioner of all of this, but actually my friend sent me this great book because I've been looking about fascia and, um, and so that this was written by a friend of hers, cultivating a sustainable core, sustainable. I know we don't all love that word, but um, it's talking about fascia and the chakras and this bioelectrical communication, because I think that's really what it's going on is this bioelectrical communication with the field and our biology. Um, and so that entrainment of the vagus nerve, of the gut microbiome, of your heart chakra, um, it's not just the the neurons in the brain stuff. It's the Mike 11. I had a crazy dream. I hardly ever remember my dreams, but like while I was in Pittsburgh, I had a dream that Mike 11 wanted to come hear me talk, <laughs> that I was giving a lecture in Kentucky or something like that. And he's like, I'm going to come and hear you talk. And I thought, oh, isn't that funny? Like my, my subconscious playing jokes on me, but it is the cell to cell communication, the bioelectricity. So all of this human potential movement stuff that was happening. And again, don't frame it as new age. The new age stuff is not, is going to be insufficient. Like the, oh, Barbara Marks Hubbard and the new age people are taking over the world. No, it's way more complicated than that because Barbara Marks Hubbard was cultivated by Salk. And if you look at the board on her like center for new futures, it's, it's not calling something new agers is like the bow tie man telling me to look at the little box with the people talking astrology. It's a diminution of what's actually happening. Um, this, the space race, you know, especially in Huntsville, Alabama, NASA in Huntsville, where Werner von Braun and the Operation Paperclip scientists were, that space race of the late 60s into the 70s was running parallel to the inner space work, right? To all the SRI work, to the SLN work, to the remote viewing work. And that was coming through Edgar Mitchell in Houston, right? And so what I'm trying to talk about, like with child divination and using children with access to the, <laughs> the field, right? That this was, um, this is about this consciousness. It's about the inner verse, right? Not the outer verse, not the universe, the inner verse. And so when you're looking at H the Houston schools being taken over, that KIPP started in Houston, you have to understand space medicine, whatever that is, and biofeedback and neurofeedback and discipline and access and NASA and Rice University and nanotechnology to understand what's going on there. It's not just a school choice conversation, right? And so this was made so very clear. Now, Riser had um, a close correspondence with a woman. Her name was Julie Medlock, I think. And she was a journalist who landed at Auroville, A-U-R-O-V-I-L-L-E. 
in India. And Auroville was essentially set up with Indira Gandhi to be this quintessential um, UN sustainable community. And um, at the time, it, I think it was Sri Aurobindo was the main guy. But then after he died, his the woman who took over was... Um, Oh gosh, she was like a French Turkish woman. They called her the mother, <laughs> but she was not Indian. She was not East Asian. She was French Gypsy, I think Turkish. Um, Alfas, Alphonse, Mira, Alfas, something like that. Um, and this woman Julie connected with her. So uh, there's a lot of papers and riser stuff about Oroville. And essentially setting up Auroville as this prototypical, like sustainable community. Um, and, and she, you know, it's, I feel sort of bad because Julie, she was a very active person, but um, ultimately had a stroke and, you know, didn't, didn't all work out. But so the, the, the satellites that Oliver Reiser was working on in the end of his life, these sort of communally owned uh, co consciousness coordinating satellite projects, it was something called Project Prometheus and Project Krishna. So it was two, it was a twin, right? East and West. And so a lot of this early broadcasting, like again, to get everybody in the right story was targeting India. And, and of course, India is a huge target of impact investors and these development impact bonds for girls and getting everybody hooked in because the entrainment of India as well as Africa and Latin America is so important because I think also the, the, the melanin is important as an optical material for this new optical computing. Um, so yeah, so, you know, it's clear to me at this point in the trajectory, right? You know, and I keep, I'm not saying I'm at the end point, but that Web3, formerly understood as blockchain, is about creating ledgers of information that will be accessed interdimensionally, I think. Like it's an interdimensional computing system. And it's part of this networked processing that that parallel processing that our biology is parallel processing is really important. Um, so Robert Smith III, he had a lot of papers in risers, um, uh, riser stuff. Uh, he's hard to look up because there's like a bazillion Robert Smiths. But Robert Smith III from Pineapple, Alabama, and he was an organizational behavioral psychologist at NASA. And he had access to a Watts line back in the 60s when nobody had long distance phone calling. Because I think if you had long distance phone calling, you wouldn't have all these boxes of correspondence. So we didn't have, they didn't have cheap long distance. So you had to write the letters, which thank goodness, because now we can go back and look because there's not, well, probably Google and the NSA has recordings of all our phone calls, but so be it. So Robert Smith was using his free Watts line to connect all of these people. He was the node in these computing systems of being like, you should know him and you should know them and you, we should get together and do this. And he wrote the chapter in uh, the book Emergent Man with Julia Stolman and Irvin Laszlo called The Unibuts. Now I talked about that, um, you know, sadly, I think I made that video private because it was with Cliff and we're not on speaking terms of it anymore. Um, but it was about property management. And the Unibuts um, chapter was essentially about creating a space-based colonization, which is what Barbara Marks Hubbard was focused about. And, uh, you know, um, and, you know, all of the, the libertarians, the utopian libertarians and the space, you know, extropians and all of that stuff that are all about like living in these communal things in space. So um, that's what Smith was working on. But the Unibuts was actually based on the kibitz model. And so that's what I've been talking about with Jason and Leo and Lynn about the, the we work and the, the flow that's coming is that it is this kibitz model, which is ultimately also the socio-technical cyber physical socio technical system which is the ant computer so but he knew how to work people right he knew how to work people's psychology and so i think that the psychology aspect and the parapsychology is really important and again nothing to be written off as hocus pocus stuff that we that is actually the core of where things are going and there were a lot of, there was quite a bit of correspondence with Andre Puharich um, in, in those boxes and um, uh, J.B. Ryan, the head of the parapsychology lab. So we need to stretch our understanding of the token engineering 
beyond simply economic processes, they're signals. It's a language and it's a coordinating mechanism. And it's an interdimension, in my opinion, it's an interdimensional coordinating mechanism that really has a lot to do with um, the psyche and our connection into the information field individually and collectively. Um, so, you know, when I was making the, 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 the heart outside of the eye and ear place, our reality is understood by our senses. Like our senses tell us what reality that we're in. It, it governs us. And, um, you know, and, and I'm going to be telling a little bit more about like how lipids fit into all of this. And, um, but we live inside stories. We live inside information. Now, whether that's chemosensory information that we're tasting or we're smelling or we're feeling, you know, touching things, you know, seeing things, reading books. Um, our reality is the information we get through our senses, um, either interacting with the environment or interacting with one another and then telling stories that make sense. And actually, I, I have this huge map from the Maniac TV show. And in one of them, oh, the main character, Owen, male lead, he's talking with this woman in a diner and um, and he's talking about the Gnostic Gospels. And then he's talking about like um, essentially our brains are computers to tell stories to make sense of the world. And that's where we're at, right? And that's kind of um, the way. And so where you, where you get your information matters. Um, and because we can't know all the stuff. You can't actually know one, per well, until we're more highly evolved, we can't hold all the information at once. So we have to pick and choose where we get the information. And, you know, a lot of people in the resistance are very um, critical of like the normies that get their information from here. But they don't actually reflect on the fact that they're also getting their information, like you're getting your information from me, and I can't tell you all the information. So, you know, what I'm giving you is by its nature limited, but we all have to choose, right? And and then and then we creatively construct stories from that. And um, I was looking at an article, they were talking about um, how the brain works and that you can divide, I, I don't know if I already talked about this stuff, but split the brain and that you could stimulate one side of the brain and, and it like the right side, I guess, and the left side wouldn't know. And so on, you would stimulate the right side and say, like, get up or drink this water. And then you would ask the left side why you did that. And the answer would be because you told me to. But the left side would like make up a creative story about why, like to justify that action, even though it had no basis in what actually had happened. And, you know, I saw that some like with my dad when he had dementia, that the mind is very, very creative. And it'll just make stuff up, even if it does like you give a, a few bits of information, you'll make up a really good story. Right. And that's what we're all in the process of, like making up stories to try to make shit make sense, because a lot of this stuff doesn't make sense. It's like, you know, you know, why are we pushing telemedicine on Latin America with phones when we're asking like Mexican low income women to put phones on their pregnant bellies for telemedicine when we know that that's bad for bodies? But, oh, maybe it's because in these papers with Oliver Reiser, they're talking about fetuses having ESP. And then there, there's some access that the unborn fetus has to the field that the system wants, right? Like I'm trying to make a story how this makes sense that to get your conditional cash transfer, you're supposed to hold a, a you know an electromagnetic frequency device to your pregnant belly for remote fetal monitoring. One for like it's some impact investor somewhere, but two because I think that there's something in that frequency based entrainment that is serving this larger system. Like I'm trying to like make sense of the pieces. And that's what I'm constantly in the process of quilting that together. Um, so yeah, so what I'm trying to encourage people to do, and again, like everybody chooses, so I can't, I'm not, I don't have any right to tell you what, that you're wrong if you're not doing this, but what I was doing for a long time was making these maps and saying, these are the maps of the bad people. And this person is connected to this person and they're bad and this bad and this bad. And, this. and I just had big maps of bad people, right? And I think that's a lot of what the truther community is kind of about because they, they it's, it's interesting because when you talk to people about it, it's kind of the same script. Like they've eaten from the same menu, right? It's like they went to the same restaurant for every, you know, once a week for the past five years, and they know all the things that's on the menu. And they can tell you about Jekyll Island, and they can tell you about the Federal Reserve, and they can tell you about Bilderberg, but they don't know about JB, like they don't know all of the other stuff, right? Um, 
because they've been fed the same menu. Like they all ate at that restaurant, right? And you can almost like, like it's the same information because they've all eaten from the same menu. And so what I would say is like, rather than trying to understand um, all the players really and decide like who's bad or how bad or whatever, is like, think about um, the ideas, like think about the concepts. And then from that point, I think you have a more sophisticated understanding of what's going on rather like, and sometimes actually knowing the players can lead you to the concepts. But, you know, I was, I was sitting with someone in Pitts, in Pittsburgh, we, we, we met up and I said, you know, we, you, important ideas, you have to understand uh, proprioception, right? You have to understand the idea of like your body in space. You have to understand the idea of the holobiont, like your in, internal organization, right? We have to understand the ideas of stigmergy, which is coordination and digital pheromones. So these are all things that are like the core ideas that aren't really good, bad, one or the other. It's just like you need to start developing a vocabulary, a conceptual framework that you can talk about it rather than just people and, and, and then... Anyway, so so that's I'm, I'm trying to encourage people to do that. Um, and so I guess this is just coming to my trigger point. <laughs> and I'm not going to like say this person's name because ultimately if it gets back to them, they'll know who it is. And but like I'm trying to figure out how we relate to each other. And this is such a feeble mechanism right here. <laughs> like I understand the limits of this thing. Um it's very limited, right? And and I'm not saying again. I, I'm I'm always clear to say I'm not saying I'm outside the game or I'm better at this game. I'm just trying to go on the pilgrimage and figure out what is actually going on, right? What is actually going on? Um, and so one of the things I've realized is that information theory and the feed they decide when it's appropriate to know certain things or talk about certain things in the feed, the algorithms will amplify or they will suppress, right? Like we all know that's pretty standard. And so one of the reasons why it was hard to leave the pretend community of social media, um, at least in the feed-based social media, I know this still counts kind of as social media what for what it's worth, but um, you know, it was hard to leave that because you feel integrated with that community um, but I realized that probably most of the things that I was talking about would eventually get talked about, but not the way, not with the lens that I was offering. And they would be talked about at a time in which it became acceptable to talk about it, right? For a reason, because that reason advanced the greater program that was emerging, you know, and at this point, like, I don't know, maybe this is the noosphere. Maybe there is something coming out of the field you know, besides the interdimensional biofilm that's happening on all of these fronts and has been at least for a hundred plus years. And, and like, who am I little Allison to sort of say that I can like stick, you know, my finger in the, the, the door and like pry it open and stop the thing. I can just see it. <clears throat> but um, the social media tells you your reality and, and it's not just curating the information, like the senses, the, the feed is your secondary sensing device. Like this is what I'm realizing. It's like, so we have our five main senses and then we actually have our intuitive senses, right? These other senses, but the feed is substituting that. The feed is telling you your reality by putting stuff out there. It's another sensing, it's a mechanical sensing, it's a prosthetic sense that has been offered to you and we all picked it up as if it was an authentic sensing mechanism. And of course, you know, you know, is seeing believing, like, can your senses lie to you? They, they probably can. And certainly like if they've got the rhodopsins and the various things going on in your, you know, therapeutic lipid management, like they can, they can fuck with your senses in that way. But like at a very superficial level, like the feed as a, as a prosthetic sensing mechanism is telling you the story of what reality is by how you, what, how you occupy that space, who you surround yourself with, how you engage with that content. And then that's all going into the digital twin land, right? And we, we, we know that. Um, and it, it made me sad because like I have sort of compassion for the Allison of the summer of 2020 because I didn't like 
really the past four years have been a, a front row seat, immersive experience of psychological warfare, right? And if you look at but Robert Smith III at NASA, organizational psychology, like he knows that that's what it's about. It's about, um, like he wouldn't call it psychological, he would call it organizational development or something like that, right? But it's about managing our perception of the world and our consciousness and our, our souls, right? And so I feel like I've sacrificed so much in trying to communicate the world that I saw from the seat that I had in Philadelphia as a public school parent who saw things that were not right, who was trying to break down the boxes and have these bigger conversations. And the thing that triggered me last night was actually, it's about blockchain. And for me, blockchain has kind of been a touchstone because that's been the drum that I've been beating for so long. Now, I didn't know when I started blockchain impact finance that it was going to go into parapsychology. Didn't know that, right? There's other things I probably don't know yet about blockchain and about their soul bound tokens. You know, I didn't know about trichotomy and the soul and the spirit and the body and all of that. I didn't know everything, but I knew that Goldman Sachs was looking at creating global derivatives <clears throat> based on toddler futures linked to surveillance play tables. And when when the lockdowns happened, I thought that I could, <clears throat> not that I, I could because I wanted to be important, but I had an obligation to expand the conversation to include this understanding. And then ultimately, I started to understand the digital twinning better and the Web3 and the token engineering and the cybernetics and then the Macy conferences and you know the entrainment and the, inter like it, it kept going. <clears throat> And maybe we're not all meant to keep going, right? I mean, in reality, maybe not everybody's up for the pilgrimage. You know, not everybody gets a scallop shell. I don't know why that arrived for me, right? But if you followed me on Facebook, when I was on Facebook, you knew that I took a lot of heat. I was on blockchain from the beginning. This is not what you think. This is not good. This is not freedom. This is not okay. Crypto gaming, having children in Latin America do crypto gaming is not okay. None of this is okay. The surveillance play tables are not okay. None of this is okay. And at the time you remember, and I think if you're being frankly honest with yourself, the number of influencers in the health freedom space, in the freedom cell space that were promoting blockchain as liberation, that was always part of the game, guys. It was always, and I was always saying that it was always part of the game, right? And and I took heat for that, right? But I had integrity because I knew in my heart that that's what it was, right? And so I had many people continue to say, well, Allison, you're too difficult. We don't understand what you're talking about. Now, these are people who know nothing about like biotechnology, who are like figuring every single shit out about biochemistry, right? Like who are not trained scientists. They chose that. They chose where to put their attention, but they weren't going to put their attention into token engineering or impact finance because they actually wanted their crypto tokens and they wanted to hang with people who like crypto tokens and they liked the idea of the freedom cells and they liked whatever, right? They were part of these groups that were clearly put in place to manage the parts of the agent-based simulation, guys. Like, I think if you're really honest with yourself, you can look back at all of the influencers and understand they were all offering you a menu to get you in the restaurant. And then ultimately all those restaurants are gonna like end up like connected to the same back alley dumpster <laughs> fire, you know? And it makes me sad because again, I'm here facing major life change and, and it's going to be okay. Like I'm ultimately going to figure it out. And I'm, I'm, I have more stability than a lot of people. So I, I, I'm grateful for that. And I, um, I acknowledge that, but I thought I was doing the right thing. In fact, um, you know, I told my mom last week, I was trying to articulate this and I'm like, you know, I think some people maybe imagine that I was like a rebel all along. No, I was a good girl. Like I did all of the right things. <laughs> I, 
because I thought that there there was a world that as I, I thought I understood the world and I thought that there was a way to be a good person in the world and that I was doing that right and um and it was a lie I was like mom it was a lie all of it was a lie but now you have to pick up the pieces in the lie and figure out what happens next um and so one of the things I did as the good girl who had some resources was when um somebody reached out to me on Facebook who seemed to um who was going through uh, an upheaval in Tulsa at a university that was being taken over and the humanities, which was something we both valued was being stripped out and repackaged and it was being turned into a school for cybersecurity and all of these sorts of things. Um, said, hey, can you come down? I have some people, we need to figure out what's actually happening here. Like there's something, like there's one level, but then there's something else. And so I did, and actually, and it was, it was, it was a, that was one of my first steps of, I'd actually, I'd made one other trip to go to Seattle in like 2019, in the fall of 2019, like one of my first talks in public. But this was like, my, this I'm not like a jet setter, right? So I'm like, I will come, right? And I, I paid my way. I flew into Dallas. I met up with my friend Lynn in person. It was great. We did a little Dallas tourism. That's where we first saw Old Parkland, which was amazing. And that was a big, important part of like my journey on this pilgrimage. And then I drove up to Tulsa, right? And I... Um, I stayed with this person, um, you know, in their home and gave like three or four lectures um, in this giant downtown public library to 15 people. And, and it didn't matter because ultimately the people who were in the room are in the room for a reason. And, you know, and it was a lesson for me because one of the people in the room, she was a woman who she had met the woman who was hosting me at a school board meeting. Because in addition to this, whatever was happening at the university level, it was also deeply happening at the school district level. And it was also happening, interestingly, I think, with uh, with the Indian, indigenous uh, funding. And I think also the hearing, the deaf community, maybe, which is interesting from a sensory standpoint. I may be wrong on that, but I think that, that the deaf community. So there was this late night school board meeting right before I had arrived. And the woman in the audience had been at that school board meeting. And the woman who hosted me was handing out flyers about the talk that we were giving. And she was in the room. And um, this woman came. And she was maybe in her late 60s. And she had brought someone. And I was talking about blockchain and I was talking about these transcripts, these mastery transcripts of which both Dallas and Tulsa were uh, pilot, leading pilot cities. And you can look at on my blog, uh, if you Google Dallas, Tulsa blockchain comes up. It was like one of my first three hour talks. I was like, I can't believe I gave a three hour talk, you know, like, oh gosh, you know, that's back in the day. And I did it multiple times because like some people came late. So I had to give it again, right? I had like hundred slides, blockchain, the new slavery. Now at that point, I didn't know about and computer. I didn't know about complexity theory. There was a lot I didn't know, but that I knew that these derivative securities tied to human capital, that it wasn't just about P21 workforce development. It was something deeper going on, right? And ultimately I would just see how deep it got. But I was talking about the afterlife of slavery and Justin Leroy's early talk on social impact finance, social impact bonds. And this woman who had said she was with, um, oh gosh, Oral Roberts University, right? So Jerry Falwell. Now I'm I'm still identifying as like a very left-leaning East Coast liberal, right? You know, progressive. And she, like she would be probably on the very other side of the um ideology, right? On, if we understood each other as stereotypes, as these archetypes. And, but she understood what I was talking about. Like she understood. And that was a really important lesson for me along the way. And, you know, again, I'm grateful to have had that opportunity of the invitation. And I would just say that, you know, I did pay my way down there and everything, but like I was, I was grateful because what I came away with was this idea that we are all being put in boxes of metadata tags with the understanding that the people that the box that we're in, well, we're the good people because we all want to be good, right? But there's different flavors of what good looks like or how we understand the story. But in those boxes and like this, me and this woman, we would I, probably have, be, have been filed separately in different boxes. Any of those boxes doesn't have all the good, like, and 
I guess foundationally now I've come to understand like the idea of good people and bad people probably is not super helpful either. Right. But at the time I was still back in that framework. Like there's no, all the good people or all the bad people are in one box. Like, Oh, my box has all the good people. That box has all the bad people. No, like in any given box based on archetype or criteria, there would be people who would be working towards um, empowering their fellow people, right? And then there would be people who would be fine to compromise the agency of other people. In every single box, there's a mix. And then so our task is to have, to shine our light, you know, and again, I think this is where the chakra stuff comes in, to shine our internal essence to do the next right thing as we understand it at the time. And sometimes we do something we think is the right thing that down the road we realize wasn't, but we didn't have enough information to know differently. And to be, have integrity and have principle, right? And that to let that vibration happen in the real world, right? And that was an important lesson for me to set that aside, set down stereotypes aside. That was really important, right? Because this teaming, this artificial teaming that they're setting up is all about the simulation. And so the thing that that upset me was because I feel like I have been very consistent in my position throughout all of these years. Now, I've evolved and I've expanded my view. And when there's new understandings that I've come to, like I just said that the good, bad thing isn't super helpful. I've acknowledged that. Right. And I'm trying to offer that to other people as lessons I've learned. And that may be helpful to you guys too, you know? Um, and so, and, and I've acknowledged my, my changes of opinion. Like right now, I don't think it's so much about the global brain. I think it's maybe the guy of fash is a better term. Like I talk about my process, but I've always talked about it with integrity. I've always, while I haven't dragged my family into it, I've always been very honest about my situation in this landscape of where I am. Like I've, I've been, I share a lot, a lot personally about who I am. I'm not a player. I'm not here to monetize stuff. I'm just me. And you can go all the way back to 2016 and my first YouTube video in Philadelphia City Council when like the like I have compassion for the me that was the me who was still so clueless. And I have to hold that compassion for other people who are still so clueless and know that I'm also so clueless about the many things that I don't know yet. But we we have to come from a place, in my opinion, of like what what is our relation to one another and what has the feed done to that relationship to one another? Because I've the other lessons that I've had is that in social media, that it's not real with few exceptions. Like there's a few people that I've met on social media that I, I have met in person and we have what I understand to be a true friendship. But these Facebook connections can be made and broken super easily. And that's all part of the entrainment. And that's being done remotely through frequency based stuff. Although I do think that we have to enable it. Like, I, I think, I think we in some ways have to co-sign having that happen. And um, so yesterday someone shared with me an, a, a, an article that this person wrote. It was a long form article, like very long form. And um, they have a blog. They don't post to it very regularly. And um, often they're very short pieces, but this was long. This was clearly a very thoughtful article. Now, um, it's actually in the line when I, I first connected with this person. It was, I can't remember if it was before or after we met, but a really extensive article about the Kaiser Family Foundation and what was happening in North Tulsa in the Black community with impact finance. And it was a really important article. I, I, I'm not sure that it's still available, actually, but um, it was that kind. It was a long form and it was all about blockchain. Okay. And so this is... Um, and this is where I'm talking about things are timing, you know, when, when are things allowed to be talked about and how are they allowed to be talked about? So again, this is a person who hosted me in January of 2020. We didn't know that the world was about to change in like seven weeks. We didn't have any idea what was actually coming. Uh, and at that point, this person knew very well what blockchain was, what blockchain transcripts were, what they meant in terms of financial derivatives and what they what it meant in their community specifically, because it was rolling out in Tulsa with Kaiser and Schusterman. Um, 
so this article, long form article, very much about um, essentially saying, setting up this Hegelian dialectic, acknowledging a Hegelian dialectic that the central bank digital currency narrative uh, versus crypto narrative was sort of a, a setting up stable coins. And essentially that like the crypto narrative was always part of this plan of moving us into the token economy, right? Um, and there were a few mentions of behavior management um, and impact, but ultimately like no mentions of digital twinning, no mentions of agent-based simulation modeling, not about web three, not about soul bound tokens. Um, and that's a limited article, right? That's, that's telling a certain story, right? That's telling a story that blockchain is about money, money and with a side of social control. And what I've been saying for four years is that it's not really about money. It's a signal. It's about a social signal. It's a communication mechanism. It's a flow mechanism. It's a coordinating mechanism. It's for the super organism, whether you understand that as the global brain or the Gaia fascia or the psychic ink computer. That's what blockchain is. And so I, I, I just keep thinking. So this was a person when I, when people were throwing stones at me about blockchain, because early on, again, I went up against John Bush and Derek Bros. Right, the very beginning, right? All those people, all the people on Rockfin getting their tokens, like all the James Corbett, all the people accepting Bitcoin, all the Whitney Webbs going to, you know, Miami and getting their Bitcoin on. RFK Jr., all Bitcoin guy, they've known this is, I mean, and I, I think the resistance doesn't want to admit that they've been had the whole thing. Now, again, they can join team token economy, big freedom coin or whatever, and think that they're not in the ant computer, but they're just, they're just being played in the orchestra. Give me some more crypto gamers. Give me some more Bitcoin libertarians. Boop, 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 boop. They can just put, and those influencers were put there for that reason. Who's given all that money for these greater resets, right? It should be very clear to you at this point, but people don't want to acknowledge that because they've, they've got, they've built a community around these people. And so this individual, like early on was not willing, like wanted to be in the crew of the greater reset, at least speak to them. I don't know, maybe being in the crew is overstating their position, but they were fine to participate in at least one of these presentations because the narrative was, well, these people have access. We need numbers. We need to go where the people are. We need to meet people where they are. We need to tell them the story they're prepared to hear. Allison, nobody knows what you're talking about. Four years later, Allison, nobody knows. Why is that? It's because I'm doing it wrong? Now, I'm doing it the way that I'm doing it because it's, it's the way I can do it, right? We all have different gifts to offer into this space. And I've, I've always said I appreciate people who are collaborating in, in good faith in the same problem space. And I would welcome translators if you want to dance it, if you want to sing it. I'd rather you not make a video game about it. <laughs> but if you want to tell this some way, like people have written poems, which are like beautiful and touching, right? I, I, this is not my thing. Like, and, and what I was triggered by was not the fact that nowhere in this long form article was the work I had done on blockchain acknowledged? I mean, in my inner heart, actually, it did hurt because I, I have this picture of the two of us sitting at this person's kitchen table. Um, and this is a person with a background in the humanities, a background in the classics, um, a person of faith. Um, and we were there as mothers at this table. And we were connected, right? But then in the feed, 
in this entrainment, which I understand better looking at all of the riser papers and where this came from, from the 70s with NASA, with the satellites, with the sensors, with the organizational psychology, right? And, and much further back, the Macy conferences and then the psychical people. Like it's been a long buildup, but those ties can be broken by the feed, by the fact that we're doing social engineering, by the fact that the resistance thinks that somehow it's, it's, res it's resistance is the game. The resistance is the game. But that's why no one will talk about the game because then you'd actually have to admit that we're in it. And we, we have built our identity and our sense of superiority is that somehow we know better or we're outside or we're ranked above those other people, <laughs> right? And so when Whitney Webb came out against me, now she wouldn't say my name. She didn't have the courage to actually say my name, but it was clear who it was because it was about her inner exchange and with Raul, who I was backing up because I knew something was wrong with the blockchain digital wallets on Rockfin. And I knew that there was something fishy and I, was, I saw a need and something that was injustice and I was trying to figure it out, right? And at that point, I had asked Joseph Gonzalez, who had an expertise in all of this, because essentially Joseph has done all of the bad things in his CV. If you look at his LinkedIn, Joseph Gonzalez unity and, and will all come up like, you know, again, it's this whistleblower, like the, the whistleblower turned. Now I know things are bad, like it, it never works out. Like I was trying to get things sorted out because I knew that there was something wrong with the attention token economy. There was something wrong with the digital wallets. And so then not only did Whitney Webb say, oh, the only reason that I was talking about blockchain was to get back at her and her little crew and deprive her of her income, even though the, the famous investigative reporter couldn't go to my blog and, and Google, you know, put in the search term blockchain and see I've been writing on it since 2017. And again, a woman who is a mother with small children who's not talking about blockchaining children you know, this person chose not to, and I, I wasn't even asking for like public going to battle for me, right? But even to acknowledge that that thing that was going on wasn't okay, because guess what? There was a cachet there. There was the sense that if you put your social capital on the line with Allison, who's a problem, who has like a firm position against this crypto, it's going to actually, there's going to be some blowback. And it's going to impact my online identity. Right. And so if you don't understand that if you've created yourself inside the box that is Facebook and your identity is so linked to that, the story you're able to tell is essentially going to be a dance with the feed. It's going to be a dance with the algorithms. It's not going to be that heart to heart conversation over a kitchen table. It's going to be a projection and a reception through these information fields that are coordinated by military and behavioral psychology. And again, I, I, I understand that this is also that, right? I'm not saying that this isn't that, <laughs> you know, um, it's that too. But I can, I can see it and at least talk about it and acknowledge that. So those were hurts to my heart. And this, this person, I had continued to send on occasion information pieces about that that were relevant to Tulsa, that were relevant to their situation. Um, and, and the one exchange I did get back was I was pushing about Derek Rose because, again, this alignment or if not straight out endorsement, this inability to actually push back at some of these narratives, but to simply let it go, right? Because choosing to let things go and not talk about them too is also a choice that has consequences. And so when all the stuff came out about Derek Rosen, crypto gaming, and he, his answer was about child sovereignty, promoting child sovereignty, right? And we knew what that was about because again, we'd stood on the stage in January of 2020 in the Tulsa Public Library, and we talked about what child sovereignty really was. It was about derivative securities and using children as digital finance instruments, right? There was no willing acknowledgement that that was a problem. And so those are all choices that people are making on this way. Like we're all making our way. Why are you here? 
Why am I here? I'm trying to figure out what's going on. I'm trying to figure out what happened. I'm trying to figure out why Joseph Gonzalez would attack me and run me off Facebook and be such a goofball idiot. And why like people that I thought would be my friends, there was pretty much silence. And that the one person eventually who did stand up for me then also turned into a totally different person when I came in their time of need and a difficult time for myself. And then told me essentially their community didn't want to hear anything about what I had to say wasn't important. So I've had many of these things where I'm here just to say that this journey of the heart, this thing, this screen that we're dealing with is a disrupting technology and not in a good way. And so if we're going to write a really long form article four years later, acknowledging that the crypto space was a strategic implementation to drive people into the token economy with social impact, but we're not going to link it back to school choice and Jeffrey Yass and the wisdom of the crowd and child divination and any of that. We're just going to leave that because that's too hard. You know, that's, I don't know. I was like, did anybody like say Allison's been talking about this for four years? Like, and, and the, the person said, well, you know, actually one person said, oh, you know, other people have been trying to talk about this, but oh, Julianne, you just do it the best. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oops. I said the name. You do it the best. It's hard because I've been asking for help, right? I'm not looking to be the lone warrior. I'm certainly not like I'm realizing the hero archetype is not effective at this point. But if you want to be out there and you're listening to me and you've also told me that you so admire my work, but you're going to say, oh, Allison was do didn't do it very well, right? Allison sacrificed her, wrecked her family, her future, every, her lost her job, is like building a whole new identity for nothing because she wasn't doing it right. She was clearly making it too hard for us. Now we're prepared to actually understand blockchain four years later because our favorite influencer, you know, is saying it. And we like that because now we're, we, we vibe with that. And that's an entrainment mechanism. And so as much as the person writing is responsible, the audience is also responsible. So if you're someone who is partaking of both research streams and you weren't prepared to weigh in at the time on blockchain because you were too connected to the crypto influencers and it was uncomfortable to think that maybe James Corbett and Whitney Webb and these people didn't have their it all together, that they weren't telling the total truth. Because that was hard because your community was with those people you love hanging out in those chats and those comments and whatever, throwing money their way. That's too hard. Why is it that now it's going to be okay to talk about it? But we're going to talk about it, but we're not going to talk about the toddlers on the surveillance play tables. Because this person, we actually did an intervention in the Strive Conference lobby with our banner of children being not impact investments. Don't blockchain our children. We went into the lair <laughs> in Tulsa and did that. But then it got put under the rug just for me to carry. And then ultimately the question is, will that be erased? You know, will my work be erased? Because as with all these things, by the time they talk about it, they're not gonna talk about it in the way, <clears throat> in my opinion, in a more nuanced conversation about agent-based simulation modeling and archetypes and psychoanalysis and lipids and, cause it's too much, too hard. Just give me an easy story. The Galian dialectic. Oh, it's about token. It's about stable coins. Okay. Those are things, those are some words I do. I don't really want to know about proprioception and holobionts and steganography. And that's too hard. That's too hard. Um, and, you know, that's my burden. That's my thing to live with. I, that's my trigger. And I, I own that, right? Um, I just... I wonder what are we in? What are we in that someone who who could how how do you forget? And how do you choose? And and 
because this article obviously took weeks to write. Was I anywhere in the background or literally have I been erased? And is it that easy? If it's that easy to be erased on the internet, what are we all freaking doing here anyway? <laughs> no, you can erase people out of your heart, you know, who are trying to do the right thing. So, um, yeah, it is a rocky landscape <clears throat> and the human psyche is complicated. Jason talked me down for the ledge. I didn't go off on a crank last night in my night flannel nightgown. <laughs> but I put this in context. I think sometimes people were like, I don't really like your pedantic lectures or just whatever, you know. But I say this because this is my journey and I'm sharing my journey with you is that like, what is an authentic relationship? What is an authentic friendship? How do we be with one another? How do we stumble and reconcile? Is there reconciliation in a world of cancel culture and the token economy? What, what does it mean for the resistance to live in an attention economy now and to, to literally be living within a social credit circle? Because they, they have their own social credit system. They just aren't acknowledging it, right? Um, yeah. When are we going to talk about the digital twinning and Web3, um, subtle energies and psychic energies and photonics? Um, and I know it's a lot. You know, somebody asked me the other day, like, I have a friend who wants to know about AI and the spirit and all of this. And what is it? And, um, you know, do you have a video to share? And I was like, I don't have one. Like, it's too much. Wouldn't it be nice if I could just give you a little infographic? Like I was making infographics early on and tell you like, oh, here's a little thing. Let me hand it off to you so you can think about it. We all have to do our own work. And, you know, and part of my work was spending a week in a windowless archive room going through a philosopher's correspondence to see what I could find. And a lot of what I found really re-emphasized the parapsychology and the spiritual aspect of this. And so I think in that way, I'm just, I'm exploring things that may seem uncomfortable for some people because I, I'm not a nihilist. I do think that there must be something some way through this landscape, you know, thank you, Eve, I've got the scallop shells, you know, <laughs> actually, so in addition, I'll just close by telling you the, um, the other, uh, the other uh, hearts that I made. I made, uh, so I did the one outside the, oh gosh, what is it? The, which was the name of that lab? Oh, Steppers, I'm sorry. Uh, Chang Zhang lab. So I did the Chang Zhang lab one in the rain. And then the next day at the end of the day, I went to the foundation for the study of cycles. Cause if you guys have been following my work, you know, about the, the cycles where Edward Dewey, right. And so he did most of his work in like Connecticut with the, the financial crowd, but somehow his papers ended up like at the end, after at the end of his life, or when he retired, they went to Pittsburgh. So uh, 124 South Highland Avenue was the, the where Foundation for the Study of Cycles was for a time in Pittsburgh, like in the 60s. So I went and um, the, the, the building is still there. I put a heart there. And then um, uh, and then I made one. Oh, where else did I do one? I did, I did one on the way out of town at Carnegie Mellon um, at the Hillman Center for Future Technologies, which is about programmable matter. <laughs> Um, and so I made that one was all iridescent. So I used all of the like ones that were kind of like big fingernails, like shiny, silvery, pearly looking ones. And I had a cypress and, um, I see Jason's on here. I, um, I, uh, uh, the, uh, we are out on a, a lake in Kansas and I got some, they had, it was full of pelicans. <laughs> there was this lake full of pelicans and I got some pelican feathers. So I had, pelican feather and a coral piece and all of the silver. So that was at the Hillman Center for Future Technologies. And then, um, oh gosh, there was one other one that I did. Oh, the Rand Corporation. Yeah. So somebody that I was visiting was, was like, yeah, did you know the Rand Corporation has an office in Pittsburgh? And I'm like, I did not. <laughs> so I made the Rand Corporation one and that one, you know, and, and that one, like the, the one that I put at the eye and through, it had all the spirals, the snails, because that's a big part of it. It's all the spirals. And um, 
like the spiral of creation, because actually that's what Riser is talking about is this like spiral dynamics, the inward and outward spirals. And so, yeah, so I put like, so I had some, uh, I put one at the Rand and, you know, like, again, I sort of wonder what people think about like when, when they come out and they see these hearts and they're beautiful shells, like somebody will have some nice shells. Um, and then the last one I did on the way uptown was at this, the new church of Pittsburgh, which is the Swedenborgian church. And I think again, Emmanuel Swedenborg, uh, he, um, he, what he walked the realms. He was a Swedish, mystic philosopher in the 18th century. And I think a lot of this links to electromagnetism and the Aurora Borealis and frequency. And so he did all the steganography about visions and these realms. And so uh, again, in Bryn Athen in Philadelphia, we have the the Pitcairn family originally from Pitt, Pittsburgh played glass. They have this big estate and they brought all the Swedenborg papers here uh, to Philadelphia, which is really interesting. Um, but uh, the Pitcairn patriarch, I can't remember his first name now, but he went to church in Pittsburgh. He was raised in the Swedenborgian church with Andrew Carnegie. And so I think this idea of interdimensionality, realms, mysticism, you know, world peace, the Carnegie peace stuff, because the Carnegie, you know, as much as people want to talk about Rock Rockefeller, I mean, the Flexner Report was initiated by Carnegie and Carnegie remade teaching and learning, remade medical education, uh, set up, well, actually Rockefeller set up the psychiatry, but um, the Peace Prize, it is all about this homeostasis. So like, were they wandering in the realms? Were these mystics and seeing this vision of us being integrated into this, what feels like a Borg, you know, really. Um, and so, yeah, so that was the the last one that I I left outside the the church, the new church, Church of the New Jerusalem in Pittsburgh. Um, so again, I I have compassion. <laughs> I mean, I just um, like we're all on our own journeys. That's I guess that's we're all on our on the road, right? And um, and it's hard having like navigated the trauma of the lockdowns and the aftermath of the lockdowns and the disentrainment of my heart chakra of my family and my loved ones, the ongoing separations of people online who were people I thought were in the same problem space, that we cared about the same things, that we held the same values that continue to shed um, my associations and, um, and to really not be connected, right? Like it's human to want to have a community. It's, and they know that like the Robert Smith, the thirds of the world at NASA organizational theory, like they knew that they could use the, 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 these spaces to create communities, artificial communities that they can then can manipulate. Um, and yet still here I am. So, um, you know, maybe once I get settled in hot springs, I won't be here so much anymore because I'll find a way to find new people or maybe I'll just, you know, grow a bunch of dahlias and zinnias and walk around barefoot in my garden and read books and not do this anymore. <laughs> um, you know, it's, but yeah. So part of my journey is getting over this trigger of being like, all the hard things that I lost for standing up on my principles around blockchain and what it really was about turning children, not only into to derivatives, but now I understand into channels to divine sacred field for some sort of bio, in my opinion, bio hybrid social computation, gamified computational process. And that we're not going to talk about this now because I'm doing it wrong because I'm still, um, I'm making it too hard. I'm not telling the story the way you want to tell it, right? You know, oh, other people have tried, but, you know, you, you, you know, this other person, this other, you've just said it so well. Now, could it be that really your brain wasn't prepared to hear it till it was told in a way that you found acceptable? And, and then what does that mean for all of that? for all of us, if that's how we go, if that's how the stories are told. Um, 
you know, ultimately I don't wish ill on this person. I just, you know, again, with the bow tie man, why are you here? <laughs> I'm trying to figure out what's going on, right? I'm trying to figure out how I could sit at a kitchen table with someone and fly, you know, halfway across the country to talk to 15 people, one of whom, you know, was so one person in the audience is he was like a philosophy classics guy and his classics and religion is now at that crazy Austin university, university of Austin, you know, freedom thing, you know, and that's like backed by Palantir. <laughs> and, you know, I'm thinking, how does this even happen? You know, how, what are we in guys? What are we in? Um, you know, so yeah, I'm laying out the pieces, but whatever I'm doing, it's like some assembly required. <laughs> I think maybe that's what I'm saying. Some assembly required for this. I got my maps. I got my stuff. I'm not charging you money. I'm not selling you a supplement. You have to, we have to put some stuff together ourselves and it's complicated. It's like some kind of crazy Lego set of like a Hobbit village. That, you know, it's going to take us, you know, an indefinite amount of time to assemble, you know, but, um, and you don't have to do it. You don't have to be here. You know, you don't have to, but yeah. What is it that we are in? <laughs> we are in some fields, guys. We are in some entrainment fields. So um, anyway, that's all I have to say. I don't, um, I don't, uh, you know, again, I'm, I'm not, I'm saying this to process it out loud with other people, not to make this person wrong. They're just in their own process and um, they're just in their own process. Clearly, Joseph Gonzalez was in his own process. Raul was in his own process. Cliff was in his own process. Everybody's got their process. Um, and I, I still am grateful for, uh, my cohort of problem solve collaborators that were in, we're still there because there's still interesting things to find out. So, uh, don't forget to tune in tonight. If you're not exhausted of me, um, at eight, Jason, eight Eastern, Jason and I are doing, uh, another installment on the Arkansas stuff. Um, actually on this is, is focused on Amache. Uh, which is it was a Japanese internment camp in eastern Colorado um, and uh, the Sand Creek Massacre. So it's only a couple hours, so it shouldn't be too taxing. All right. Bye, everybody. <laughs>